In this video clip, I'm going to be changing direction in regards to a very important topic that I started about a couple of weeks ago. For the last couple of weeks, I have been doing a series on gold and silver. I've been calling it why gold and silver is so safe. And I'm ready to change direction again. So let me just explain where I've been going with this. In the first two clips, I just wanted to get people's attention. I wanted to explain to people that if you have an asset and you do the littlest thing wrong, you make the littlest mistake, we're not talking about people who harm other people on purpose, we're talking about, you know, you can make the littlest mistake and they take your assets. But I've also explained that gold and silver are not assets. And if you're new to this, I suggest you watch the first two clips, because this is not going to make any sense. The first two clips are very, very important. But if you have watched it, you will understand what I'm talking about. And then, of course, the next three clips, I talked about the most, uh, the most relevant things that always come up. I always get asked the same thing. Well, hold on, you're saying that gold and silver is a hedge against inflation, but you know the value of gold and silver sometimes it goes down it not it's not a very you know it's not a very secure and i get hit with that all the time by people who are looking at things from a day-to-day -day point of view but as i've explained if you look at things from a 10-year point of view the value of gold is going to go up and the value of silver too and i've i've explained all that before i don't want to go into it all over again but actually what i will say is this in 1971 an ounce of gold was selling for $35 an ounce. In 1980, if we look at things conservatively, it was selling for $300 an ounce. And that's that's looking at things from a conservative point of view. So then the next thing I had to do is I had to say, okay, well, look, there's actually a few technical details that I need to be looking at. That, you know, I, you know I've, I've said all these great things about it I need to go through the actual legislation and what I've noticed is ever since I've done that the amount of interest in those later clips has not been that great when I did a clip on another another clip which didn't have so many technical details but talked about the value of gold and silver versus the value of a trust that some people say oh I'll just put my money in a trust to keep it safe Within about a day or two, I have as many views on that as I do on the 7th, 8th, and 9th clip, which is all about the technical details. So what I'm saying here is there are a few, one or two more clips for me to go through in regards to the technical details, but I'm going to take a break from the technical details for a while and give you something a little bit more exciting. So I assure you, you will find this some of this information fascinating if if you like what i've said in the first two clips and the third and the fourth and the fifth clip this is you're going to find some some things out there you probably never thought of and whereas the sixth seventh eighth and ninth clip is more about proving and going through the little details okay so unfortunately though i need to okay actually sorry I, okay I, i've skipped ahead of myself okay so the the first th there's basically three things i'm going to be covering the first part is that your bank account is an asset now some people are thinking well that that doesn't i that's the part i don't get and that's what's going to be covered in this next set of clips why is a bank account an asset in fact why is your the money in your pocket an asset that's something that you know how, how does that how does that make any sense because when we're talking about a motor vehicle when we're talking about a bank loan and when we're talking about property in each of those things there's a deal between two people you do this for me I will pay you and if you don't continue to pay they can take your assets so that's very very straightforward and understandable and it makes sense but hold on how is your bank account an asset? 
And how is the money in your pocket? How are the banknotes an asset? You haven't signed anything, or have you? The second issue is the, interna the internationalization of certain laws. So just a couple minutes ago when I said, I, I, but we need to get started on this, I was actually about to, to talk about a particular point which proves that American legislation and New Zealand legislation in some ways are almost identical. So it's the internationalization of how all these things fit in. And the third thing and the most important part is about this thing here will, when you understand it, you'll be able to see how it connects to just about everything else that I've, I've talked about here. Which also explains the internationalization part of it. So what's going to be covered in this with the last point that I was referring to is let's take the roads for instance. You want to use the roads and the government's going to pay for the roads. Okay. The question is, whose money is the government going to pay with? Is it going to pay with your money and all the other taxpayers' money? Or is it going to have to borrow money to pay for the roads? Now, if you're an American, go to the US debt clock. How much do you owe? Now, this is just Washington, D.C. That's what the US means. It means just Washington, D.C. There's the United States of America and there's the US, okay? How much does just the US Washington DC owe? $20 trillion. How much does New Zealand owe? It easily owes uh, more than 100 billion. Now that's if we're looking at gross debt, I'm not, I'm not gonna get into the technical details of that, but if, if we're looking at the total amount New Zealand owes, we easily owe more than 100 billion. So when they say the government's going to pay for the roads, hold on a minute. Are you sure the government's going to be paying for those roads? Yes, the government's going to be paying for those roads, but it's not going to be with your money or the government's money. The government is borrowing money and it happens through the bondholder. And so what happens is the bondholder, the only thing they're interested in is the same thing that the judge is interested, you pay up. So if they're lending money to the government to build roads, what are they interested? You pay up. That's what they want the government to do. They want the government to pay up. And the so you go and you say, I want the government to do this, I want the government to do that. The government doesn't have the money. The government is borrowing money for that. So the bondholders can in a way dictate the terms, but will not quite dictate the terms because if they make the terms too impossible, well, it's, it's not worth borrowing, is it? So... That's the third point, which will all be explained. All these three things will come together. So let's get started. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is we want to start off with the internationalization of certain laws. Okay, so if we look at UCC 9203 for now, that's American legislation, and it will be proved that it's definitely applicable to America. It could also be applicable to other nations, UCC 9203, Attachment and Enforceability of Security Interests. And if we look at, it says a lot of things, but if we look at part one, it says value has been given. And number two, the debtor has rights in the collateral or the power to transfer rights in the collateral to a secured party. 